we see in verse 9 the ascension itself. Christ goes up. He rises from the earth. After he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a crowd received them. We see then the appearance of the, the angels. It says two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up at the sky? And then they repeat the promise of the second coming. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Why was the ascension necessary? Well, one reason it was necessary was to, to discourage rumors. What if Christ had just disappeared? What if they didn't see him leave? Then there would be rumors. In Shia Islam, the so-called 12th Imam, the last great representative of Allah on the earth, disappeared. So the Shias say. The Shias say he's going to reappear on the earth during the Battle of Armageddon. Well, you know, the Iranians are Shias and most of the Iraqis are Shias. This is one reason they don't mind the Battle of Armageddon. They don't mind building a nuclear bomb. They don't mind dropping a nuclear bomb on Israel. They don't, they don't mind starting the Battle of Armageddon because they believe that their Messiah is going to come back during the Battle of Armageddon. So they're most eager for the Battle of Armageddon because he disappeared. And, there's the, and they say he's still alive. He's still alive in the earth and he never died. Well, Jesus died, Jesus rose, but Jesus did not disappear. Jesus ascended into heaven before witnesses. It was also to prove his spiritual authority, to see him rise from the earth, and also to hear angels who would come and bear witness to the authority and the fact that he was coming back. It was also a pattern of his future return. He will come back in the same way he left. He leaves to heaven, he will come from heaven. I told you yesterday that I believe his footprint will touch down on the same place that it left from. On the Mount of Olives. Now, we can outline acts like this. Jesus goes up. The Holy Spirit comes down. And the church goes out. After Jesus ascended, they gathered in the upper room and they're going to make a decision. They're having a prayer meeting in the upper room. And those who are in the upper room are named, beginning in verse 13. But it's not only the disciples who were there, but the women were there. His mother was there. And his brothers were there. And they've got a job to do. They're going to replace Judas. Remember, it was 12, but now it was 11. Judas was a disciple. Now Judas is dead. Did Judas lose his salvation? No, Judas never had his salvation. Because John 12 tells us that Judas was stealing money all along. It's horrifying to think that there could be a false disciple. But if there was a false disciple among the twelve, then there are certainly false disciples in the church today. And we shouldn't be shocked when someone whom we think is a leader, like Judas was a leader, who even had the treasury for Jesus. We should not be shocked when someone we thought was a leader shows that he's not a follower of Jesus at all. We have this pattern in Holy Scripture. We have this pattern in the life and betrayal of Judas. So, why should we be shocked? Why should we be surprised? So they get together to replace him. They talk about um, Judas. They say that he fell and evidently in some hideous, horrible way, his intestines were poured out. We see that in Luke, uh, excuse me, in Acts 1, verse 18. In the Gospels, we learn that he hung himself 
he hanged himself. How do you, um, how do you harmonize those two accounts? Well, you harmonize them this way. He hung himself. He hung there for a while. The rope broke. And when the rope broke, he hit the ground. And when he hit the ground, his body was so decayed that it fell apart. Now, that's a gruesome, hideous thing to think about. But we don't say that, say that we have contradictory accounts. We say that we have complementary accounts. The gospel t Gospels tell us a few details about his death. The book of Acts tells us a few more details about, about his death. And so they set, they set down some standards to choose a replacement from for Judas. And one of the standards they sit, sit down is that he needs to be somebody who actually knew Jesus, who knew Jesus in the days of his flesh. Verse 21, Peter says, It is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they have two nominees one person who's called Joseph and one person who's called Matthias. They pray and then they, um, they draw lots, verse 26. This is a way of gambling. It's like you put all the names in, you put the two names in the hat, you don't look in the hat, somebody sticks their hand in the hat and pulls it out. That's not the way they did it, but they did something like that. Now here's a question. Are we supposed to do this today? You know, there are some Christians who've, done, who've made big decisions throughout church history in just that way. The Moravians, who were a great missionary force, they made decisions that way. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, who was greatly influenced by the Moravians, he made decisions that way. Are we supposed to make decisions that way? No, we're not. This is the last time it ever happens. It happens before the Holy Spirit comes down. After the Holy Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2, they don't do that anymore. And um, it's not a common practice anymore. But it did happen in Acts chapter 1, and they choose Matthias and he becomes the twelfth apostle. Now, you'll hear some Bible teachers say that they should not have chosen Matthias, they should have chosen Paul. Well, Paul wasn't saved yet. And you will hear, you will hear some Bible teachers say they shouldn't have chosen Matthias because we never hear anything about Matthias again. Well, that's not a good argument because we also never hear anything about Thomas again. We also never hear anything again about the other Judas or about James the Less. We also never hear anything about uh, a lot of the disciples again because the focus of the Holy Spirit and the focus of the Holy Scripture is not going to be on all 12 of them. It's mainly going to be on Peter and John. James is going to die in chapter 12. And beginning in chapter 13, it's going to be, the scripture is going to be focused on a new convert whom Christ makes an apostle, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul. Okay? But there's no harm in saying that Matthias takes Judas' place now. Okay? That gets us to Acts chapter 2, one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And when you think, Acts chapter 2, you need to think Pentecost. You need to think the descent of the Holy Spirit. When you think John 3, you think the new birth. When you think Matthew 5, you think Beatitudes. When you think 1 Corinthians 13, you think love. When you think Hebrews 11, you think faith. And when you think Acts 2, you think Pentecost and the descent of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've already begun talking about Acts 2 in this great chapter about the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But I, th I think before we completely leave Acts 1, I need to say something about this business of finding the will of God. 
because all I basically told you was that we don't cast lots anymore. Maybe the Moravians cast lots, maybe John Wesley cast lots, but I'm not recommending that we try to discover God's will by some game of chance, by some physical expedient like casting lots, the way they determined that it should be Matthias and not Joseph who would be the successor to Judas. Well, if that's not the way we find God's will, how do we find God's will? And if we don't come away from Acts 1 saying that we determine God's will by casting lots, is there anything in Acts 1 which is a model for us, a pattern for us, something that would help us understand how to discover God's will? Well, I think there is. First of all, they got together to pray. That's what it says in Acts 1.14. They were in the upper room uh, praying. Evidently, it's something that they usually did. Um, the 12 were named, or several of the disciples were named. And then Acts 1.14 says, These all, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus along with his brothers. So they prayed. They also dis consulted scripture because in verses 16 through 20, they interpret what has happened to Judas by studying a passage of scripture in the Psalms, Psalm 109. And they find in, in Psalm 109 that it says, um, let his homestead may be made desolate. This is Acts 1 verse 20, let no one dwell in it. They view that as a reference to Judas. I guess under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they're, read, they're led to that passage. And then they determine what they should do after Judas' death because of the same passage in Psalm 109. They read, let another take his office. So they determine the will of God through prayer. They determine the will of God through consulting Holy Scripture. They also find God's will together. They don't do it individually. They don't do it by themselves. But the whole community of believers is, is consulted. When we think about what we do, when we find we need to find God's will by understanding what God's will is in terms of what's already been told to us. That's what it says in Ephesians 5, 17. We need to find God's will by doing the will of God that we already know. If we do the will of God in those areas we already know, we will discover the will of God in those areas that we don't know. So the best way to find God's will for the future is to do God's will now in terms of what you know God's will to be. Let me ask you a question. If you haven't done God's will in terms of what you already know, why should God teach you his future will in an area that you don't know? Because if you're disobedient, it doesn't help to know God's will. Knowing God's will becomes a liability, a negative thing, not an asset, not a positive thing. Because if you know God's will and don't do it, you're being disobedient. So the great way to discover God's will is to do God's will in terms of what you already know. That's what they're trying to do. That's what they're trying to get at in this passage of Scripture. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning account number 24109-0150 or make checks out to EFCA 
Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.